Happy Monday, Liberty Kitty Cats. And before we get into today's episode, I've got to remind you about all the extra content we've got for our patrons, our members of the Lions of Liberty Pride. You can find out more over at patreon.com slash Lions of Liberty. But guys, for as little as $5 a month, you can help support this, your favorite libertarian podcast, the greatest libertarian variety show on earth. Uh, if three shows per week, three free shows wasn't enough for you, guess what? There is so much more behind the paywall over on our Patreon. We have Conspiracy Corner. We have Degenerate Gamblers. We have bonus live streams, bonus segments with guests early episode releases of many of my interviews and we really really work hard to make sure we are delivering quality content and really getting you value for your money so we don't just expect you to throw money at us although that's nice too you can do that by donating directly on our website lionsofliberty.com and over at paypal.me slash lionsofliberty but if you want to be a recurring donor the best place to do so is at patreon.com slash lionsofliberty we need empower people with not just the philosophical tools, but the inspiration to break free from the system. Welcome to the flagship Lions of Liberty podcast, your weekly dose of education, inspiration, and real-world application from the top minds in the liberty movement. If you want liberty, we need to be better leaders, better husbands, better fathers, better friends, better businessmen. We need to be better people. <laughs> Guide, your shining beacon of liberty, Mark Clay. Today I am with a gentleman you have heard on this show before, possibly on some other shows. Uh, he has been for a couple of years now. Um, I don't know if you want to call it co-host or what have you, but uh, the, the second in command, I guess, over on over with Jason Stapleton on uh, Wealth, Power, and Influence. Uh, but he has recently started his own outlet, his YouTube show, along with his co-host, Stephen Messina, King Pilled. He is Matt Erickson. Matt, are you ready to roar? I'm ready to roar. I thought you would be, because you've been roaring <laughs> quite a bit out there lately. Um, I, I think we talked about a year ago when I was, uh, I've kind of, I was kind of, in the lock the for early stages of the lockdowns and i brought you on just talk about everything that was going on back then but one thing we didn't really get to uh in that interview and that discussion was your background so i want to start there a little bit what is your background how did you first get involved in all this libertarian political stuff that we that we are all in all wrapped up in now oh that's a that's a good question that's a kind of a, it's I, I think it's a fun story but of course we do because it's my story I, uh, I grew up in a pretty conservative Christian household, and it was very uh, not super politically woke, I guess you would say. Uh, it was just very kind of ordinary Republican, neocon kind of. And we were, we were first and foremost Christians, and then, and then politics was sort of downstream from that. But this was back in the you know, late 90s, early 2000s, when the, the nature of the system hadn't been quite as, as revealed to us. So there was a lot of, a lot of people were kind of, were very enamored with some very romantic ideas about the nature of our country and the government and all that. Anyway, so I didn't really get involved in, in political conversations or anything beyond just kind of election year stuff. I might have an argument with someone and talk to them about why, you know, of course, not in Iraq for the oil, you know, it's because of freedom and democracy and all these things. And, and until I got to college. And once I was in college, I decided, I found out that I had a very vested interest in the political situation because of student loans. I was very unhappy about the situation I'd gotten myself into with student loans because I, I went to college kind of just out of desperation. I didn't really have another option. Uh, and it just kind of seemed like, well, I might as well just go to college. And, and someone said, just, here's these forms, just sign them and you got money. Like, okay. Exactly. Well, that's what yeah. you're doing. Huh? And, and I'm being, and I've been told my entire life that if I want to be a success, the only way to do that is going to be by going to college. If I don't go to college, then I either have to be the most unique outlier, you know, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, Mark Zuckerberg style outlier, or I'm just going to be a failure. And uh, I guess I could have gone to like a trade school or something, but that wasn't for me. And I knew it from the beginning. So I was like, I might as well just go to college. And I mean, that's a, just a, the, the type of a, of a culture, a political culture that would lead someone to make a decision like that. Like we kind of take it for granted now, but you've got at 18, 19 year old kid, I, they have no idea what they're doing. I'm 32 now and I have no idea what I'm doing. You know, I'm just, you know, every day is a new day and I'm figuring it out as I go along. So like an 18 year old to take on $30,000 a year worth, worth of debt is just, it's just, it's, it's unbelievable. It's there's, 
when, when people, especially people in the libertarian conservative type of community, they like to have this attitude of like, oh, well, you're the one who took the debt on, so you should deal with it, you know, and you're just suck it up, you know, cupcake, and, and you know, everyone else has to deal with it, so you have to deal with it. Pull up those bootstraps and get to work. <laughs> right. But it's like, you, you, in, if, if somebody took an 18-year-old kid and talked him into signing his life away for a Maserati, or, or not a Maserati, Bugatti, so there's a bit more similar uh, price point. If someone like, said, here, here, this is, this is a reasonable financial decision, do this. And, you know, they gave you some, ex some explanation for it. You'd be like, this is criminal. There's no way you could trust an 18 year old to make that sort of decision, but that's effectively what college is. So uh, I, I got very interested in, in the subject of student loans. And then I recognized how corrupt the university system was that it, this was, it was like criminal levels of corruption, the way that they would strong arm you into, into I don't, I'm at a, I'm at a pretty, uh, relatively upstanding Christian university too. I wasn't at some state university or something, you know? So this is just the way I felt like I was being strong-armed into spending, into signing my life away for all this money and like being guilted if I thought that maybe if there was something to question about this. So everyone just kind of just shuts up and just goes along. And it's, the culture develops in that, in that, in that vein where everyone just kind of goes along to get along. So I, when I was like doing like textbooks, like buying textbooks, and it was like, $800 a, a quarter for textbooks that I could go online and I could get the used one for, I could get all of my used books online, even back then, 15, 20 years ago, I could get all of them online for, I don't know, less than a hundred bucks. I'm like, why am I getting all of the, why do I have to buy the new one? This is a, this is a scam. Yeah. And then and, they require you to get the updated edition. They're like, no, last year's is no good, even though this is the same one with just a different date on it, but you got to pay premium for that. Exactly. It's a, we have to get the updated code or something like that. And it was, just, it was just so flagrantly a scam. This was just, it was a racket. And so I started getting very interested in, in student loans and, and right about that time or shortly thereafter, uh, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren both really came on the scene. So to give you an idea of just how blue pilled I was, I saw them as effectively well-meaning, uh, very kindly old uh, you know, avuncular type people that were just, that were just, you know, trying to help out the, help out the little guy. Like that's the way that I perceived them, you know, but people were saying, well, this is socialism. You know, you can't, you know, you can't be doing all this stuff. It's, it's socialism. And of course, growing up in the culture I did, I knew that socialism was a big, bad boogeyman. So, so I started doing my research. I was like, okay, I want to, I want to explain why. Cause like my intuition said that this is profoundly unjust. This, this financial system is criminally unjust. And in any other sort of circumstance like this, it would be like, yeah, it's appropriate to have some sort of a financial, like a bailout, basically. You know, we, we're bailing out these other industries. Why wouldn't we bail out students who were conned into making terrible financial decisions? And the so I started doing my research on the economics of it. I wanted to prove why this was, uh, why I was right, like why uh, Bernie Sanders was right about everything. And What's fascinating is right about the same time, I when I was in college, I had to do a research paper and I wanted it to be on something kind of interesting. And my dad had started listening to Gary North and was kind of getting into libertarian thought that direction. I think he probably in 2008, I think he probably read Ron Paul's book or something like that. And and so he he was sort of starting to chirp at me about these libertarian things and showing me the connection they had to our Christian upbringing and all that. And so I decided for my research paper that I wanted to write about the gold standard and, and the, the connection between, I wanted something provocative and something that would make me stand out from the crowd. So I wanted to write about the connection between uh, inflationary monetary policy and tyranny or totalitarianism and with uh, specifically through Nazi Germany. And that's, so that's what I wrote about. I wrote my research paper about, and I, I that, that was basically, I knew nothing about economics before that. So to write this research paper, I had to go get caught up on everything. And uh, so because of that, I got introduced to Tom Woods podcast. As I was trying to get, get information, I found this Tom Woods guy. Oh, he had some interesting books that I'd, I'd, I'd gotten some, I'd, I'd read a little bit of through my research paper. And so I was like, oh, I'm going to listen to his podcast. And that was, those things were happening at the same time. Like here, I was, I was doing this Bernie Sanders student loan, Elizabeth Warren thing. And this gold standard connected to Nazi Germany and listening to Tom Woods. I was doing both of these at the same time. And 
So it's so I kind of brought a pretty interesting, I kind of a, I think a unique perspective to the table where I'm super conservative Christian background, very strongly interested in student loan forgiveness because of my own personal vested interest in it, and then fascinated by the economic connect the connection between uh, loose economic policy and tyranny, totalitarianism, and uh, so that could basically it just that's kind of where it all started. And then I went from Tom Woods. I ran out of episodes with him, so I said, okay, let me libertarian podcast. And I found Jason Stapleton. And so I started listening to Jason Stapleton, joined his private Facebook group, met this hot chick in that private Facebook group who wound up starting to work for him around the time that I started dating her. And uh, we got married, moved down to Southern California to, uh, to work for Jason, or not for Jason, but with him. We're kind of working alongside him as we're working on our own projects as well. Have you forgiven him yet for moving you to Cal- <laughs> back to California? <laughs> well, that, well, that's funny. It's funny you would say that because uh, I've been talking about this on my own show a few times recently. People will say, will make comments kind of along those lines, sort of like, like, uh, you know, oh, I can't believe you live in California or what's it like, you know, getting, getting bent over by the government every year and yeah, that sort of thing. And the way that I see it is I, like, I love Southern California. Now we don't live in LA. We're out San Bernardino County. So we're, we're in a better part of Southern California. Uh, it's not completely away from the political craziness, but like we see Trump signs around all over the place out here and, and Trump. Those don't exist here. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I bet they don't. <laughs> uh, so I, the way I put it is when somebody drives, say somebody decides to drive a Maserati, the Maserati is going to be expensive to drive. You know, they've got to use premium gas. They've got to like uh, tires cost way more. Everything's going to cost way more, but you wouldn't look at someone who's driving a Maserati and be like, ha ha ha, I bet you it sucks to, to, to fill up that thing. Huh? You know, like people just don't, don't approach it that way because it's like, Obviously, it costs more in gas because I'm driving a freaking Maserati. That's how I see living in Southern California. It's like, yeah, it's more expensive here, but I, I choose to live here because I love everything else that you get with it, and I'm happy to pay more for it. And I, I think this kind of that sort of mentality is sort of what led me down the road I did to where we wound up starting this King Pill podcast because I rather than trying to, like, I live in California, I have a reason to live in California, and I like aspects of it. So I don't want to ha- sit here with this cognitive dissonance where I'm like, you know, I love having beautiful sunny weather 360 days of the year. And, but it costs a lot to stay here. So am I miserable or am I happy? Well, I'm just going to take it as a constant. Yeah, it costs more to live in California. The state is, 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 is expansive and totalitarian, whatever. You know, it, it just is, it exists. I'm not going to change that fact. So I'm just going to accept it as a constant and then um, use that as the foundation that I build off of. So now this is, I just know if I want to live here, that's that much more money that I have to make every year. And money is abundant and easy to make and you can get it anywhere. So rather than framing it as, oh, the, well, the state is oppressive and totalitarian and that's why I can't get ahead. I'm just going to take the state as a constant. Like the, you know, what else? Like, like uh, tornadoes are a constant. If you decide to live somewhere where tornadoes are, you don't rail against tornadoes and complain that they exist. You chose to live. I'm sure you're like being swept away to out out of Kansas there, Dorothy. All right. I mean, life life is trade offs at the end of the day. Every single position you put yourself in is some kind of trade off. And none of us here in the United States have the option of moving to the Ancapistan state. So we're all choosing statism of some kind. It's just, you know, what's our trade off? Maybe some people live in a state that does have lower taxes or no taxes, and they're happy there for a number of reasons. And that's great. Uh, I don't like paying the taxes here. I don't like a lot of things about here, but I I have, you know, there are many, many great things about this area that are completely disconnected from the government or the politics or or any of that stuff. So it's all about trade offs. It's only in the last year that my calculation of those trade-offs has changed a bit because before it was just like you're talking about, it was more expensive to live here, but I made more money than I might make somewhere else. So that kind of all added up to me and I was still living in a place I liked. I I do look at things differently now though, because now it does feel like maybe it's a little different in San Bernardino. I don't know how much, but it feels like the culture here specifically has become so, I don't know what you want to call it, masky, lockdowny, COVIDy, all of that stuff wrapped up in one. And it's only when I, I actually recently traveled out back east to see my parents, even in liberal Connecticut, um, it's a completely different world. Like I was at a bar talking to random people and shaking their hands and hugging people I met minutes ago, just like the good old days. There, are, I have friends here that will not shake my hand still. So it's it, there's definitely a cultural difference, and to me, that's that's what what pulls me more now than you know having to spend more money or pay more taxes or, or, or anything like that. 
Right, right. And that's, and again, like you said, it's trade-offs, you know, this is, this is all economic activity is about trade-offs and, and everything is economic activity. So the, uh, it, it's like, if, as it becomes more and more expensive to live here, both in financial terms and in, in social terms, mm -hmm. then that, that begins to change the calculus. So like how much more money can I make living here or, or just how much do I like the sunshine? You know, it gets, it gets to the point where that starts being brought into question. And, uh, and then you start to think, well, there's sun in other places, I guess. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, exactly. And so we're, we're starting to make that, uh, starting to do that, that calculus ourselves. We just signed a three-year lease on a house here. So uh, three-year lease. We're, wow. We're I didn't here. Know yeah. that was a thing. Yeah, it was a, it was a nice, um, uh, it was a, a, I guess, a matter of circumstance that the, the people wanted to, they wanted to, we were desperate. Like we wanted this house. We love mm. this house. We love the neighborhoods. So we were like, what can we do to get into this place? We're willing to, we're willing to expand our budget, expand a few things to, to get into this place. It was also because Amy was six months pregnant and we were yeah, like, we need, don't want to be moving. Spot now. Yeah. Right. yeah. So, uh, so they were like, well, are you willing to sign a three-year lease? And we're like, willing, <laughs> that'd be fantastic. You know, lock in rent for three years and not have mm -hmm. to have that as a constant and not have to worry about it. And, and it is in San Bernardino, it's, it's, it's pretty different. I mean, people wear masks everywhere. Uh, but I, I, since we've been out here, I've never heard a single person having a conversation about masks. I've never heard people yelling at people for wearing them. I've never heard, I've, I've never encountered any sort of conflict or anything over them. Um, and people, basically everyone wears a mask if they're inside a store, but then probably outside, it's probably like 75% of people are unmasked. Wow, and yeah, because- even here going hiking, uh, like in Malibu, we went hiking a few weeks ago. I would say 70, no, probably more, honestly, probably 90% of the people on the trails outside had masks on, had masks on. It was only when you occasionally see that maskless person that you're like, okay, you're, you're a friend, you're a, you're a fellow, <laughs> yeah. you give us other little, little nod, like, <laughs> all right, but everyone else, you're just like, well, there's another zombie. There's another zombie. There's another zombie. Yep. Zombies as Vin Armani says yep. it's yeah, it's, it's, um, outside, there's definitely people who go jogging or riding bikes wearing masks here. Um, but I just, I don't like to me, I think it's silly, but it doesn't, I don't pay too much mind to it because I'm just kind of like I'm head down doing my own thing. And nobody is to, to me, like I'm, I'm horrified by what it, what it means that people are wearing masks and, and, and that they've been conditioned into doing that. At the same time, if I need to go to the store and buy some milk, and I have to put a mask on to walk in the store and do it. It's annoying, but it would be much more inconvenient to me to not just go to the store and buy milk and have to put a mask on for a little bit. So, I mean, it, it goes to show that this is the dynamic that people are taking advantage of, that people kind of like, whatever, this, is, this isn't that big of an inconvenience. So, you know, what? but like for me, it would be much more inconvenient to fight people over it. I just, I don't, I don't want to get into a fight with someone over a mask. So I'm just, I'll just wear it and I'm going to do my thing. You don't want, and, you don't want to be a reverse Karen. You don't want to be the one yelling right. at everybody. Why are you wearing the mask? What are you doing? Right. I'm not wearing the mask. What's wrong with you? Well, yeah, it's because like strategically, what's that going to accomplish? That's not going to, that's not going to uh, benefit It's going to confirm to them way. that you're the crazy idiot they exactly. think you are. <laughs> right. Because people who go out and yell at people in public for stuff are crazy people. Nobody wants to get into that circumstance. There's a reason that those people are the, are the, the weird ones. So people will just go along to get along. And that's a problem, but that's not a battle that I'm going to win. I'm not, a, I'm not in a position where I'm going to be able to do anything about that. And really for us, because we work from home, our lifestyle has hardly changed since the pandemic. We didn't, the biggest thing that has changed really is that we don't, um, uh, we don't go to, to, to sports, sporting events. We don't go to galaxy games. And that's, and that's kind of a bummer. Like we've kind of missed them, but uh, at the same time, I mean, for a long time, they weren't holding these events, period. And so this season, it kind of remains to be seen whether they're going to require vaccines and all that sort of thing to get in there. But uh, th that that subject is is much more concerning to me. The, the prospect of not being able to buy or sell if you don't have specific forms of, of identification that require you to put skin in the game in ways that I'm not willing to put skin in the game. That that's a concern to me. And that's what could ultimately drive us out of, of this area. But again, like I said, out here where we're at, it's, I don't see that sort of thing being economically viable out here because uh, just the number of the, the conservative sentiment in this area that would, that would not be happy about that is, I, I, don't, I don't see this coming in a year. Like I don't see that being um, imposed upon us that quickly. Obviously things could change and 
we're working on our, you know, our, our bug out plan in the event that something like that happens. But, but really for me, I'm, I'm very willing to tolerate a lot just for the, the climate and the, the, the availability of the beach and the mountains and the desert. I love being in the desert. Um, I've had some kind of a weird autoimmune issue that's been bothering me for the last few years. So the hot, dry weather is just absolutely phenomenal. And if I go anywhere where there was hint or where there's humidity, then it, then it really gives me a lot of grief. So, so I'm, I think that we're probably here for a while and, and honestly, I don't mind it that much. Yeah. I mean, California, what, what's great about Southern California. Um, I mean, and this can, is never going to change regardless of the taxes or the culture or what have you is your access to such different, such a variety of geography and different you know, locations. You can go skiing and the next day you can go be in the desert and, or you can go to Vegas or you can go to Mexico or you can go to San Francisco. You can do all this in a, maybe not all of it in the same day, but, but you can do any of it in, in one day from just for, from being based at it right here. So if you are, like that kind of variety in your life, it's a great place to be if you can, yeah. you know, if, if the trade-offs are worth you. So absolutely. And, and we've heard that it out before. before folks. It's not that far from, from, you know, from Nevada or from uh, Utah, Colorado, Arizona, even Mexico, you know, and in the event that, that we decide it's time to bug out, um, we don't have to travel that far to get very remote. And so I, I like that as well. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a pretty easy escape plan actually, because uh, even if they implement vaccine passports to get on planes or anything of that nature, uh, Mexico is going to let you right in across that border. I guarantee, <laughs> I guarantee <laughs> right, you. Yeah. They take one glass. All right. Come on, come on, buddy. Whatever. They, they're, they're cool. So it's yeah, I know good. you've been down to Mexico for a oh, while, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Getting back in could be an issue if the U S wants to do something passport wise and require vaccines. But even then, to bring that, it's one thing if they bring it to the airlines, but to bring it to the physical border, that's going to be a whole different thing. And that's going to be much harder to implement. Right. And I, I suspect, I don't, I don't, I have a hard time with the people who are, who are forecasting apocalypse. And the, if you're talking about, about vaccine passports being used in the way that a lot of people, excuse me, that a lot of people are suggesting where it's like, you know, you can't fly on a plane, you can't buy groceries, you can't get a bank account. Like that's the direction that they're trying to move. That's the direction that we're being taken. But if you're describing a situation where that is the case, absolutely, where you cannot buy or sell in any way, you've got the mark of the beast in essence. You cannot buy or sell in any way. Uh, the only way you can do it is you get this passport and they're going to come banging down your door and get you like, that's going to be happening in, happening in isolated ways with isolated people. But for that to be a society-wide thing where you have to go complete like underground railroad to escape it, you're basically forecasting apocalypse. That's an apocalyptic situation where we've had the complete collapse of civilization and like, like the, the whole globalized trade network and all of that, like you would get massive disruptions to that if you impose something like that. So that's, that's the trajectory, but to have something like that happen that quickly with me fully recognizing that this whole lockdown thing happened that quickly. The reason the lockdown happened that quickly is because there was the technology to lock down like that because we had smartphones, we had zoom, we had all these different things. We don't have the technology for a, a, a complete apocalyptic scenario like that for, for something like that to be imposed and not get mass uprisings. Cause the thing that when you're trying to rule people, you want people docile. You want them sedated, you want them distracted, you want them occupied, you want them peaceable. You don't want them resisting you. You don't want them actively fighting you because just from a pure economic standpoint, it's much more expensive to control people who are, you know, uprising and fighting than it is to, to, uh, to, to just to try to incentivize them to control themselves. So I, well, I, Jason Stapleton likes to say that uh, don't bet on the end of the world because it only happens once. And if it does, you're going to have bigger problems. And I, I, re I like that framing. I don't, if, I, if I'm going to have to plan for the absolute worst case scenario being ushered in, you know, in the next six months, then I, like, why are we doing anything? Like, well, what else? nothing matters if, we're, if that's the, the situation we're staring down the barrel of. So I know we that people- We certainly need... shouldn't be here podcasting right, right now. Right, we exactly. Should, we should be really getting ready and fortifying whatever we need to fortify. And, you know, I don't know. <laughs> right. All right, guys, you know who is spitting that hot libertarian fire? Not one, not two, not three, but five days a freaking week. It is our good friends, Nate and Charlie, 
over at Good Morning Liberty. Uh, just like Brian's show, Good Morning Bleephead, uh, this one airs every single day and doesn't always air in the morning, but it is a daily great look at the events of the day. And these guys just do great commentary, great work. You don't want to miss the dumb bleep of the week, that's for sure. Uh, you're going to want to subscribe so you don't miss a single day of the great analysis from Nate and Charlie over at Good Morning Liberty. These guys have worked in the healthcare industry, in the music industry. They have some really interesting perspectives on the ideas of liberty. Very valuable perspectives. That's why I am a subscriber to the show as well, and you should be too. So check them out wherever you find podcasts. And of course, at their amazing URL, BernieLies.com. So, so and, and the fact that nobody is prepared for a situation like that is precisely what makes me uh what makes me confident enough to to predict this? Now, I mean, anything is possible in the way that these lockdowns happened. It, it you know it was shocking. If a year and a half ago, if you would have, if I would have described the scenario, said in eighteen months it's going to look like this, m- m- very few people would have believed me. So I, I'm I'm I recognize that I may be proven wrong, but that's kind of where my mind is at right now. I just I can't bet on the end of the world, and that scenario would be the end of the world. Yeah, the only thing I might question in your statement there is the idea that we would see mass protests if we tried to implement vaccine passports. I'm not so, maybe in certain areas we we would see protests and people um, rejecting it, but mass, I'm not sure if, if, do you really think we'd see mass protests? Because I I would have thought we'd see mass protests against people uh, telling us that we can't run our businesses and go to work and all stuff like that. And there was nothing at all. Uh, It was only later in the summer when uh, George Floyd got killed, then we got mass protests. So Uh, It's hard for me to think that something like that would actually trigger protests. Do you think we'd actually see people in the street protesting or do you think we would just see a lot of people just completely not complying on a scale that they wouldn't be able to actually enforce it because too many people would just simply not be complying? That, the latter. I think, I don't think you're going to see mass protests because right-wing movements don't do mass protests. Right-wing movements protest by by uh, winning a war. That's the way right-wing movements protest. They, they if, if a right-wing, left-wing violence is, is a, requires a much lower threshold and it's a much smaller dynamic. Like, yeah, we've had people riding in the streets and burning down shops and stuff, but compared to the violence that the human being is capable of, it's relatively minor. That's relatively minor petty violence. And, and it didn't take much to get those people reacting and, and, and behaving that way. Right-wing violence is a much higher threshold. It, it requires, the, because the, the right-wing psychology wants things to be, they, they want stability and peace and security. They, that's why they want institutions that can maintain society. That's why they believe in law and order, all this, because they recognize that civilization depends upon peace and stability. If you don't have peace and stability, you don't have civilization. That's just it, it, the definition of civilization is peace and stability. Right-wing people want civilization. They want peace and stability. So they don't want to get involved in, in big uprisings until they feel like their back is against the wall. And the thing is with the lockdowns and, and the, the losing, like people's businesses getting shut down and everything, it's a testament to just how far we have evolved uh, technologically that while that was really bad, it still was tolerable. People could still build around it. They could still work around it with, ice, with, with more smaller isolated exceptions. People that were just completely desperate and they you know, wound up tragically killing themselves or you know, whatever else. But like, it wasn't a, that wasn't a widespread dynamic. Because of the nature of the internet, because of the nature of technology that we have, people were able to flex and build around it. And, and, and the, the, the nature of the internet and the smartphones and everything that we have at our disposal It allows people a lot of flexibility and they're able to build around a lot of inconveniences. But I see, I tweeted this the other day that I see the vaccine passport issue as most people's line. Like that's their red line that you cross that and there's, and there's no, there's no building around that. There's no flexing around that. We don't have the technology to, to get around something like that, at least for people on a mass scale. And there's enough people that's that, that subject is, um, unpopular enough that that you're just going to get such mass disobedience that it's just not going to be viable without escalating violence to a degree that would really really cause an uprising. So there's it's that that dynamic is what's playing back and forth is how much violence is required to enforce this policy and what sort of a backlash will that violence uh, incur? You need if you're going to you you have to escalate very very slowly because if you jump the violence too far 
then you'll, you know, if you're, you're, you're boiling the frog and you can't boil the frog too fast. We'll say it that way. Right. And I, I think it's going to be a lot easier for them to implement uh, some kind of vaccine passport or vaccine requirements at say sporting events or concerts, even airlines uh, more so than the, ex the extreme that we're hearing about of, of not being able to participate in commerce or not being able to buy right. groceries, uh, that sort of thing. And I think, uh, like you mentioned, like 30 years ago, like, I don't think they could have done the lockdowns in say the eighties because right. it would have been like, you're saying it would have been intolerable and maybe technology, maybe it's, maybe that's a negative of technology in, in some way that it, it has made tyranny more tolerable. Like we can, right. we can deal with it. Cause we got zoom, we got Amazon, we got, you know, we can still know maybe 60 to 70% of people could still run their business or run a job in some way, shape or form. Uh, in the eighties, that number would be like 0% of people. Cause we all right. had to physically meet in person and do everything in person back then. So I don't know if it's a white pill or a black pill there, but uh, but there's there's a lot of pill talk lately in, in right. libertarian circles. You got the black pills, the white pills, the gray pills. Uh, I've described my myself a bit as gray pilled, uh, but you have taken on a new kind of pill here, Matt. So explain to me exactly what is a king pill? What are you doing here on the show, <laughs> king pill? First of all, d what, describe a gray pill to me, just so I so I have okay. That yeah, I, I think I'm. I don't know if I coined it or what, but I, I just kind of described it as a combination of a black and white pill. Whereas I'm black pilled in the sense of I don't think there's much hope for changing, let's say, national U.S. politics or the general trends that we're seeing in society. Uh, I don't think that any of us individuals can can change that on a mass scale. We can change things in little ways here and there. Uh, I think the direction is, is kind of the direction there. I'm more white-pilled on the opportunities that we have uh, via technology, via you know, moving, physically moving, which is a lot easier to do than, than it was 30 years ago as well. Um, and, and the ability of individuals, people to form communities, to find their own escape, find their own light uh, in this dim age here, as Vin, as Vin Armani refers to it as. But so I think, I think there's lightness to be found in the black and that's where I get the gray from. But uh, so yeah, that, that's how I describe my, my version of the gray pill. Okay. Yeah. I think we're, we're, we're pretty well aligned on that. I would, I would be, I would consider myself gray pilled as well for, for, for whatever it's worth. Um, to explain this, I'm going to back up just a little bit. And when I one of the first episodes of the of the show that we did um, was last October, I think it was September October. So Stephen Messina, my co-host on King Pilled, he he and I had been messaging back and forth privately. I met him through the Part of the Problem Facebook group, and he said that uh, we were just having these conversations, and I was introducing him to some of the ideas, some of the stuff that I was thinking about, and some of the people I was listening to, and he was he was like like more people need to hear this. We need to be talking about this stuff publicly. And, and he was like, you need to do a podcast. You need to do a podcast instead of just sending all this stuff to me privately in a message, t t t tell, tell it to lots of people and we can get more people thinking on these subjects. And so he finally talked me into, into recording an episode on why I, it was like, why, why this libertarian is voting for Trump and why, why I voted for Trump. And the way that I described it was I said, and when people look at, politics, especially, especially libertarians, they don't deal with the situation on the ground in front of them. They, they take every situation and abstract it away. Imagine a hypothetical world where that situation is happening. And they imagine in this hypothetical world that runs by hypothetical rules I invented, how would I handle this situation? And if I handled it that way, you know, how would that affect the world? And then that's how they behave. They don't behave with the actual situation on the ground. So that's why you get takes like, if you vote for Trump, that means you support everything that Trump does. That means that you, um, you can't call yourself a libertarian if you vote for Trump. And to me, that, that treats voting with more dignity and sanctification than anything that I can imagine. Because what you're saying is that voting is such an important, crucial, critical act that it identifies your entire person with whomever you vote for. The people who think and believe that way, they're far more invested in the state than anybody else because they think that voting is the most important thing that you can do. It has the most impact for whatever reason. To me, voting is just, a, it's just like an action. That it's like the state isn't the end all be all of everything. It's just, a, it's just a thing. Like if I go buy a carton of milk from Walmart, that doesn't mean Walmart's my favorite store. It means I needed a carton of milk and Walmart was there. So I bought a carton of milk from it. Doesn't even mean that brand of milk is your favorite milk. It just means right. that's the milk you grabbed. Like, right. we don't need to think about it too much deeper than that. Exactly. But so why do we think about politics as, as a much deeper, more significant thing than that? The, like the libertarian message is that you can't control this system. You have no, like you're, 
you're, you're just like throwing drops of water in the ocean. You're not actually really changing anything. To me, the reason that I voted for Trump was because I imagined, ironically, I imagined a hypothetical world where Trump was reelected and a hypothetical world where Biden was reelected. And I said, which world would I rather live in? And it was very, it was not even close. I would much rather live in the world where Trump is reelected. Now, here's where libertarians like to say, oh, well, well, well you know, there's, those aren't the only two options. You can have none of the above. No, you can't. You can't have none of the above. That is not, there was 0% You could vote for none, none of the, of the above, above, but you're not going to get one, none of the above. Exactly, exactly. So if you know the outcome of your action is going to be that your action doesn't change anything, then what's the point of your, why are you acting in that way in the first place? Is there any other circumstance where you do something knowing full well that the actions you're taking are going to have no impact on, they're not, they're not going to change anything. Like by definition, when you act, you're trying to change something. That's like the definition of action. So I, I want to, the reason I recorded that episode, why this libertarian is voting for Trump is because I wanted to get people thinking about politics in a different way, rather than treating politics or, or the state as the fundamental baseline of reality. The, the foundation of everything, of all of society, and, and the, the, the single source of everything that's wrong, like the state is the biggest enemy in the world. I wanted people to look at politics as what it is, which is just another part of life. Hmm. It's, just, it's just a thing that's out there that, that people participate in. People participate in sporting events, people buy groceries, people go to the park, and, there's, and, and politics is there. It has an outsized impact on our lives, but it's not the end all be all of our, of our human experience. And I want to see a different political system than the one we have now, but I don't know how to make that system happen. I do know that voting for third parties and, and yelling on the internet about libertarianism, I know that that doesn't have any impact on bringing about a better world. I want to learn how the political system works. I want to learn how we got to this point. How do how how does power cycle through a society? How do wh why do political parties exist? What's the reason? Why do they why do they naturally fall into this binary? Whether you've got like people argue about what right wing and left wing mean, but if I say a right wing person, you know what I'm talking about. If I say a left wing person, you know what I'm talking about. We have some sort of programming that tells us what these things are even if we like argue about the details. Yeah, it does seem so, to be in our biology. I mean, studies have been done on this, that it is basically like there is 40% or so people that are just inclined to be left, 40% that are inclined to be right. And the rest, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of making the numbers up, but it's something like this. And right. the rest are just kind of, or maybe us, you know, the people in between right. that are kind of one or the other sometimes and not necessarily. And, and what I would contend is that everyone is either right wing or left wing, that it is just a binary because- it is an indication there's 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 shades of gray within the binary but it's a largely bimodal distribution and w what it gets down to is is essentially michael malice has his test where he says if you want to find out whether someone's left wing or right wing ask them a simple question say yes or no is what are is are 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 some people better than others and he said a right wing person will say yes and a left wing person will give you a speech <laughs> and the, the reason for this is because the, the left-wing mentality is fundamentally about egalitarianism. The right-wing mentality is fundamentally about hierarchy. And the, the, the reason these two mentalities appear is because if you imagine, it's, for me, it's really easy to imagine these types of things as starting in like a, a tribe of people around a campfire. Yeah. So you've got a tribe of people, maybe two or three different families all met together and they're all around a campfire. And so you've got, I don't know, 20 to 40 people. And they're like, okay, well, what are we going to do next? You, they could sit around and they could all have a debate and they might kind of do that to an extent, but ultimately someone is going to rise up as the leader. Someone is going to be the patriarch or the, the leader that everybody looks to. And it's typically going to be an older, wiser man. That's just generally how humans are going to are organize themselves. That guy is going to dictate the path forward. By and large, people are going to fall in line until somebody gets unhappy with them. When somebody gets on, and so that you have a one party state then, then somebody gets unhappy with them. Now you have a second party. That second party almost universally will be unhappy with him because of something that ultimately boils down to egalitarianism, that they feel like somebody is being mistreated or somebody is being um, harmed by the actions that are, that are being taken. And there you've got the left wing, right wing dynamic. 
Some people say we need to stick with this path because this is the path we've always walked on. This is the way we've always done these things. And we need, in order to survive, in order to, to make our way through nature, we need to have a system of, of designated duties and tasks and traditions and rituals that, that hold us together and that create stability and that, that um, minimize chaos so everything is predictable and we can keep ourselves alive. That's the right-wing mentality. The left-wing mentality is just because we've always done things this way doesn't mean we have to do it this way. When you do things this way, it creates unequal outcomes. Certain people are, certain people are being um, uh, mistreated by the actions that we're taking, et cetera, et cetera. You get, so you get the left-wing mentality. These two, then, as the society builds and grows, these two exist in, 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 in uh, antagonism to one another. You have the people who are much more comfortable with what's familiar and what's, what's, what's uh, natural, which it means by default that they're going to be much more inclined to hierarchy. And then you get the other people who are, who are interested in what could be, their imaginations and possibilities and potential, and they're much more interested in the future. Those wind up typically, typically what they say is that these hierarchies and these institutions and these systems are too rigid and, and uh, they're too old and, and, uh, and, and they're, they've expired. We need to move on. We need to update our system. That's, that's the left-wing mentality. And ultimately... What I'm coming to believe is that religion and politics are the same thing, that it's just two perspectives on the same dynamic. And there is, if you study history, if you study the nature of, of, of human social evolution, you'll begin to, 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 to notice rules that exist about human behavior. You, can, you understand how humans are wired. When you understand how they're wired, you can predict how they're gonna behave. And then you recognize if you could predict how humans are behaving now and you go back and you apply that to the past, you start seeing cycles that humans, human, human social culture exists in cycles. Time isn't linear. Time is cyclical. And there's this constant rise and fall dynamic. It's a give and take back and forth, back and forth, left, right, male, female, order, chaos. These, this, there's this perpetual duality throughout history. And as you study this, the, the where, where I got into this was through marketing was talking with Jason Stapleton, learning about marketing, principles of marketing, principles of persuasion. And I learned that you, you sort of have an intuition for this, but it's actually borne out in data that 80 to 90% of people are, uh, are completely uh, un, un, unoriginal. They're, they're, base, they're NPCs. They're basically just, just uh, automatons that are populated by the culture around them. Then the 10 to 20%, this Pareto principle, this Pareto distribution, the 10 to 20% are the ones who govern the 80 to 90%. This is what was, what's been discovered is through, through uh, social theorists um, known as the Machiavellians. They recognized this dynamic persists throughout every single human society. There is always what's called a ruling elite. And then you get this dynamic of the circulation of the elite, which is how people from the lower 80% can get up into the higher 20%. You look and like it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you have capitalism, communism, right. anything in between, you're still going to get this end result. You might even right. still get it in Ancapistan. In fact, you would. You will. You, you will, will get it in Ancapistan because this exists in every single, it doesn't matter your social um, arrangement. It doesn't matter your social orientation. You will always get a dynamic like this. And this is, libertarians implicitly recognize this because they say socialism, communism fail because ultimately the majority of people will give their power to the minority of people. And those minority of people, like the party has to function. So it has to have leadership and it has to have decision makers and those become the state. Like that's, that's the, basically the libertarian criticism of communism. But somehow this doesn't get applied to Ancapistan. Like pe the, people don't, don't tie those things together because they don't recognize that this phenomenon is an inherent component of the human experience. It is, it is baked into the human psyche. And it's, it's kind of obvious why too, because uh, like 10% of the people have 90% of the wealth while the other 90% of people have 10% of the wealth. And it's because the 10% are special. I mean, it's, humans have come up with all different ex explanations as to why that is. They've said that they're gods or that they're, um, they've been bestowed with additional gifts by gods. Today, we might just say that they have a higher IQ or that they are more gifted or more talented or whatever. And 
yeah, if whether, you change whether you're the best businessman and that's why you succeed or you're the most persuasive and you know how to succeed up through the political ladder um it's just certain qualities that most people don't have and right. however they might use those qualities in different ways but whatever those qualities are and whatever methods they use you're still going to get the special people that end up in that higher bracket Right, exactly. And those, those higher people are always going to wind up ruling the society, whether, whether like, like directly by force or indirectly by creating the culture that everybody else mimics. Because those 90%, they want to be in the 10%, or at least they think they do. And humans are naturally natural mimickers. We, we, we engage in mimicry. This is how we learn anything. This is the, the uh, Rene Girard, the Girardian notion of uh, I just completely forgot the name of the concept, but it's 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 this mimetic nature of of uh, how how humans naturally learn things just by by mimicry by watching other people and then mimicking their behavior. It's how babies learn to walk, how they learn to crawl, how they do all these different things. It's by it's by watching, it's by seeing others do it, and then they they copy them. That's how anybody achieves success. I mean, all the great, right. all the most successful people in the world, they didn't just like figure out on their own how to do the thing they succeeded at. They look at the most successful people in, in whatever it is they want to do. If you're a football player or a quarterback, maybe you're just looking at Tom Brady and you're figuring out how he eats, how he sleeps, uh, what his daily routine is, and then you're doing that. And that's how you're becoming maybe not Tom Brady, but as close as you can get. And right. same thing for a singer or probably even a politician. Uh, it applies everywhere. Everywhere, absolutely everywhere. Humans always, so this is the debate about uh, uh, the tabula rasa, which is are, are human beings born with a blank slate or do they, uh, are they born like, like pre-coded? And I don't know about born, but I know that, that humans as they, as their, uh, what was it, Heidegger called this, this concept thrownness, that you're just like, you're thrown into a culture. You're thrown into an existing, a pre-existing society that then naturally shapes you and forms you. You know, your parents train you, your teachers train you, your, uh, you know, your other, other family members, you recognize, you mimic them, you copy them. You see people out doing things and you mimic them. All of our personalities and our, 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 our traits and everything are all things that have been um, whether directly implanted or just influenced by uh, other people and the way other people do things. And so for this reason, the 90% who want to be in the 10%, they want to do whatever the 10% are doing because that's going to, in their minds, that's going to make them like the 10%. Now, maybe they don't have the gifts. They don't have the talents or they're bad at mimicking or, you know, for whatever reason, they may not ever get to that point, but some do. And this is where you get your circulation deletes where some from the lower class make it up into the upper class. And and to have a healthy society, you want to have, I think it was, I think it was Pareto who talked about the circulation of the elites, but he said to have a healthy society, you need to have, um, uh, the, the, the elite can't be insulated. They have to, there has to be a way for people to get into them and, and update them. So you get, they get new, uh, new blood, new thoughts, you know, new ideas that keep them on, on the cutting edge kind of. And so the stagnant societies are the ones where you, you, you break that, that disconnect between the lower class and the upper class. And the upper class just starts to move along without the lower class. That's where you get resentment. You get up, people get upset and they end up, you know, you get a revolution, everything gets overthrown. But even in the case of a revolution, it's never the lower class overthrowing the upper class. It's always a member of the upper class, a member of the ruling elite, capitalizing on populist sentiment and weaponizing it against other members of the ruling elite. So this is the other circulation of the elites. Right. The, it's the founding lower fathers class. were not, you know, we're not the, the downtrodden dregs of society. <laughs> yeah, no, hardly. They were, they were, many of them were very wealthy, very well connected, politically well connected. They were, they were the ruling elite of their day. So this is another thing that when you start studying human behavior, you recognize this is just how, this is just how human societies organize themselves. They always organize themselves with a small cadre of the elites who govern the rest of the society. And again, like you said, you can, you can create any sort of economic system you want. You can start with no economic system. You can do whatever you want. Over a period of time, you will always wind up in this situation. And the dynamic exists within the elites as well. So maybe the, the top 10% are the ruling elite. Mm -hmm. The top 10% of the top 10% are going to be the elite within the elite. And you can continue that all the way up. So what this, what this indicates, it, you, you, I just, as you recognize this, you start seeing a trajectory. You're kind of like, it seems like we're meant for a king because that's ultimately what the king is. The king is the elite of the elite of the elite of the elite. He gets to the point where there's nobody else on his level. 
And he's the one, everything else flows downstream from him. This is the way that human beings, the, the human societies are naturally molding themselves in that direction. Now, we've got a, a baked in idea of what monarchy is, what monarchy means, and what it looks like. But just because we've attached the term monarchy to a specific set of historical circumstances doesn't mean that that's the only thing that that that's the only way that monarchy can express itself. But the this is where I think religion and politics blend themselves, where I think that it's that ultimately it's the same uh, software running in, in, in the human mind. And it just is expressing itself in different venues. I, I believe I, I'm, I'm coming back around to the fact, recognizing that we are meant for a king. And, and you can think of this in a, in a literal, mystical, uh, uh, religious sense in that Christ is king, that, that, that Jesus Christ was born and, and died and rose again and returned and is sitting at the right hand of the Father. You, could, you can believe it in that sense as if that's literally true. Or you can think of that as a metaphor for uh, the, 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 like Jordan Peterson talks about the about, uh, uh, dominance hierarchies, that you can think of that as being a metaphor for the dominance hierarchy with sacrifice, bringing the Girardi and sacrifice concept, and that these things, uh, that, that this story of the gospel is like the most archetypical story. It's the, it's the archetype of the archetypes for how human societies um, function. In either way, whether that story is literally true, whether it's metaphorically true, it's true in a, in a meta sense. It's, it's a, I call it, the word I've come up with, I, all I can think of is meta truth. It's like a meta truth. Right. That's why and, it resonates with so many people. And that's why that same story, it, it's you know looking at the hero's journey kind of thing. It's essentially all the same story. And the biggest blockbuster hits, the most successful stories, if you if you line them all up, if you took the top 10 biggest movies, the top 10 biggest books, you can find that same story in almost almost down to the exact details in all of them. And this is where this is where my my mind mind has been kind of racing over these last couple of years. When I've been getting into more of this stuff, I've been reading the work of Carl Jung. I've been going through Jordan Peterson's uh, like Bible series and and kind of reconciling all this stuff. Uh, and it's it's just fascinating to see. Like I can look back at all the movies that I loved as a kid and I, I see it all there. And it's so obvious. It's like, okay. So I started to think, did it, did this stuff resonate with me as a kid because it was cool? Did Star Wars resonate with me because it was cool? Yes, to an extent, but does it resonate with society at large just because of some superficial, you know, effects or what have you? No, I mean, it's, it's because they're capturing that story, that eternal story that's there, whether you don't like it, whether you reject it, it doesn't really matter. Just like the Pareto principle, it doesn't matter what system you set up, you're going to get the result. No matter what your belief system, you're going to be resonated. You're going to resonate with this story. You're going to cry in this story if you're, if you're connected enough to it in a certain medium. Hey guys, one more quick little break before we wrap up here with Matt Erickson. And if you love fine premium coffees, fine premium Italian coffees, you got to get them from our friends at Lorenzotti Italy. You can find them at Lorenzotti.coffee. You're going to want to use your discount code LIONS for 10% off your order and get these Fine premium coffees delivered in these nice little tins right to your house. Not only that, when you purchase your coffee from Lorenzotti, Italy, you are supporting some great libertarians, some supporters of this program, and some entrepreneurs. Not only that, they help others out there start their own coffee businesses, helping them acquire equipment, financing, coffee beans, everything they need to start their own coffee businesses and find a little more liberty in their own lives. So please do support Lorenzotti, Italy over at Lorenzotti.coffee. Do not forget to use that discount code LIONS at checkout for 10% off your order. Right, right. And you know, when you watch movies like that, you, you, you know for sure, like as, you, as, you're, as you're watching it, that you will begin to embody, you, you, will, you will begin to place yourself in that scenario, in that, in that movie. I mean, if, I think it's been, it's been demonstrated through scientific studies and stuff that, that, that uh, your brain can't tell the difference between a real event that you're watching and something in a movie or something in a TV show. That you're, to your brain, to your subconscious, it sees the events of the TV show as, an, as things that are actually happening to you. It places you in that circumstance. So you, the reason the hero's journey is so, is so powerful is because we embody ourselves into it. As, we, as we're watching it play out, we imagine ourselves as the hero. And again, getting back to the mimicry that humans, humans are, are wired to mimic. That's how we learn how to be successful. That's how we understand how to, 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 to uh, uh, transport ourselves through reality is by mimicking people who have gone ahead of us. 
And that's fundamentally the story of the gospel is that Jesus came and he lived this perfect life as God and man joined. And he created the perfect example for you so that you can mimic him. And if you mimic him, one day you can be like him. That's the fundamentally at a, at a high level. That's the, 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 the Christian story. And as I grew up in this culture, in this Christian culture, knowing and understanding this, I, I, I was so intimately familiar with it that it didn't mean anything to me anymore. I had to get away from it for a while. And through the course of my 20s and, and the early part of my 30s, I've been away from it. But now it's like I'm coming back around. It's like I was hiking up to a mountain and I, I saw the mountain from one side. And I, I memorized the pattern of it from this side. But then I went and took a hard right and I journeyed through the wilderness and came around from the backside and I see the mountain from a different direction. And I'm like, oh, it's, it's a complete, it, there's so much more to this story than I thought. Mm -hmm. And I come back to this meta truth idea that that story, whether it's literally historically true or whether it's just a fantastic metaphor, it has the same effect. If you study the life of Christ, of Jesus of Nazareth, and you embody the way he behaved, if you embody his principles in your life, it will transform your life. There's, there's, there's 2,000 years of history demonstrating this. People literally died for their belief in Jesus of Nazareth. They took themselves to the absolute brink, standing up for what they believed in. And they died knowing that they had something better ahead of them. Now, did they have something better ahead of them? I don't know. We don't know what happens after we die. We've got all sorts of stories about what it is, but we don't know. We just know that we really, 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 really don't want to die. We have something that we, we have this baked in, in our DNA, we have this impulse to stay alive and to do something that matters in this life. And we now, there's a template for how to do something that matters in this life. And if you embody it, then you'll be successful. And so, T putting these concepts together, this idea of, of the natural human instinct toward a king and humans being, being um, mimicking creatures, and then this story of the hero's journey that's as embodied in the gospel and the story of Jesus in Nazareth, this, the, these, these concepts coming together, like if you, as you start just kind of let the, letting these things percolate, just like marinating in these ideas for a while, you start to realize that we're pulled in this direction for a reason. It's, it's, there's something, there's some sort of force, like Ven Armani talks about bees and ants, how they, they act and they go, they do things, they act in a certain way, but they don't know why. It's just, there's some sort of force that's animating them and pulling them in a particular direction. In the same sense, there's some sort of force that's pulling us in this direction as well. And so that's kind of the religious side of things. So then from the political angle, like, it's like, okay, what does that mean now? Let's take this and apply it to politics. How, how would I behave in a political system if I knew that were, that were true? And um, I guess the answer is not start a third party. <laughs> no, no, definitely not. Because then that's the, that's the other, that's so from a, that, that was kind of like the religious mystical underpinnings, but then there's the political strategy side of things, which is deal with the world that you have, live in the world that exists, not the world that you wish existed or not the world that you imagine existed. Live in the actual world. So back to the, the Trump versus Biden thing. You have two options. It's going to be one or the other. Like everyone knew there's no possible way that it will be, that there'll be Joe Jorgensen. Like, like that, it's just not even a possibility. It's symbolic. Even the people who are her biggest supporters are like, yeah, we know it's a symbolic support and we're trying to build for the future. We're trying to, you know, maybe win this year and then next election cycle and then next election. But like, how much history do you need to show you that that's, that that's not going to happen? Like that, that just, yeah, that would need, that's okay. That, that's not the most powerful, most powerful argument. So I'm not going to stick on it. it. It just dumbfounds me that, that, uh, that people think that way. But I mean, I used to think that way and I understand, so, but I, but, but I recognize now that it's pe people are in a trance. We're, we're mimicking, we're mimicking other people. We see Republicans and Democrats act like this, and then stuff happens with the Republican Party and the Democrat Party. So then if we act like that, then stuff will happen with the Libertarian Party? But, but, but no, it seems like it doesn't. Okay, so why is that? Why do we keep winding up in this situation where 
no matter how much effort and energy we put into the LP, it just kind of doesn't grow. It doesn't do much. It just sort of exists on the outside. It doesn't have any impact on the larger picture. And it's because the libertarian message is a failure. The libertarian message is a, it, the libertarian political message is a failure out of the gates because it does not solve problems for people. It doesn't even claim to. All the libertarian it political message- It actually explicitly message, claims not to. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> It explicitly claims we're not going to solve any of your problems. The only people who would, would uh, involve themselves in a movement on that basis would be people who have no clue how humans are wired, who have no idea why people get involved in politics in the first place. It's a, it's a fact that people support political parties because they think that political party is going to do something for them. Leave aside the conversation of how it never fulfills its promises, whatever. People are very easily deceived. The fact of the matter is that people support these political parties for a reason, and it's because those parties are offering them something. So when you come with your political message that says, we're explicitly not offering you anything, we're just here to say all your shit sucks. And you we're should- here you to should spew hot libertarian stuff. fire, as, uh, as, as I've been likes to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, like it was, uh, Dave said in his, in a, or in a recent tweet, he said something like his, his plan is to spit red hot Liberty shit or something like that. And I replied to him and I was like, so, so what you're saying explicitly is that your plan is to give people rhetoric. Like people have genuine problems that they, that they need to, they want someone to solve. And your stated goal is that you're going to give them rhetoric. So then what this, this is the libertarian. If you're in marketing or in sales, you know that you need a call to action with every single thing that you do. If you you go out and you give an advertisement to somebody, here's my awesome, amazing, super cool product with all these whiz bang features and everything. Okay, so now what? Click here to buy. You have to have a call to action that tells people what to do with the information you just gave them. The libertarian political message has no call to action or the call to action that it does have is, is like the worst possible call to action. It's vote for Joe Jorgensen or support your local, I don't know, um, your, your local candidate for insurance collector. Or that's not, <laughs> right. I made that up. That's not a thing, but you know what I mean. <laughs> right, yeah. Some, some, some nonsense position that like nobody pays attention to. Now, I will qualify it and I'll say that at the local level, you might actually be able to have an impact on someone's lives. Like if you get elected to like your school board, or, uh, or sheriff. Sheriff would be a fantastic position to get a bunch of liberty, liberty-minded people, as they call them. Sheriff would be amazing. You could do a lot of like sheriffs can arrest uh, federal agents. So like a sheriff would be a fantastic position. But at the national but those, level, those kind of positions that you mentioned are almost always nonpartisan uh, races. Mm -hmm. I, as far as I know, maybe there are some places where a sheriff runs as a Republican or, or Democrat. I'm not really sure. But I think in generally speaking, like school board, uh, a lot of these local like commission positions, those are very, very often nonpartisan positions. So in that case, even then, even if you could say, well, Dave can get on um, Joe Rogan and, and all these other shows, which I, I think is, is probably the best argument. It's true. He can get a lot of media attention. The question is then what do you do with it? What do you do with all that attention? And um, maybe there is an argument that it could help people on the local level. But if, if most of these positions that we're talking about are not going to be partisan positions, Positions, is it even doing that? Right, right. And this and this reveals the, the 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 persuasion problem with libertarianism, which is that they 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 don't understand what people are looking for, and they don't understand the nature of politics. Politics is you've heard the the, the uh, Andrew Breitbart saying that politics is downstream from culture. I actually have realized that I think it's the other way around. I think politics is upstream from culture because politics and religion are the same thing, and culture is a product of politics and religion government is downstream from culture. There's a difference between politics and government. The government, the actual institution itself is downstream from culture, but it's just an institution. It's like you have a government, you have a shopping center, you have a baseball team, you have, like you have all these different organizations. Government is just one of them. What it is, is it's something that's populated by people. And this is the, 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 the key libertarian error is, is thinking of the state, number one, as a, a, a cohesive, um, distinct entity, and that it's all involved with just the government. They make this public-private distinction. But fundamentally, if you understand how human beings organize themselves, you realize that the public-private distinction is kind of meaningless. It's just 
There's people, there's people who are doing things and they're using whatever position they have to do those things. So to, if you want to sell a political message, you got to start with the culture. You got to, the, the culture needs to change before the politics can change. So then how do you change the culture? This is where you are the name of Jason show, wealth, power, and influence cultures change through wealth, power, and influence. The people with wealth, power, and influence change the culture. You might get someone who doesn't have it, like say someone like uh, uh, some Twitter person or something who goes viral and, and somehow that changes the political conversation. Has You might say, well, that person didn't have any wealth power. Well, they have influence. But ultimately the reason that it went viral was because it was facilitated. The message was facilitated by people with wealth, power, and influence. If you're getting into a political party and you, you decide you have some agenda, what's the first thing you have to do? You have to get funding. Whoever controls your purse strings controls your agenda. So how do you get people of a, of a libertarian persuasion who want to see a libertarian world, how do you get them in a position where they control the purse strings? That's the question that libertarians need to be figuring out. But then once you get those people into that position, what incentive do they have to create that libertarian world apart from loyalty to principle or whatever? Just there's some, some sentimental desire to see it pretty Ultimately, much zero as long as we have the, this current culture and this current system right to, to for somebody of, of 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 prominent stature to put their neck out for the libertarian message this the, the the potential social cost is absolutely immense it's enormous when you're asking someone someone who's invested in voting libertarian or voting uh, republican or democrat you're saying instead of doing this action that you're invested in come do this other action so their question is going to be, okay, what do I get out of it? Oh, you get to feel good. Oh, oh, oh I don't feel very good because, you know, I was going to vote for Trump and now Biden got elected and I voted for your third party and nothing changed. The worst thing that, was, that I could have imagined is the thing that actually happened. So, so screw you and your third party. Like that's, that's, the, that's what you're asking someone to put on the line. To them, they care about it. You may not care about it, but they do. And you're asking for their attention and their support. So you need to put yourselves in their position and you need to have empathy and understand where they're coming from. Understand that they, that, that to them, these things matter and they have issues. They have problems that they need to have solved. And the fact of the matter is the vast majority of people has, as HL Mencken said, um, the average man does not want freedom. He just wants safety. He doesn't want Liberty. He wants security. People want to be safe. They don't want to be free. When you go out telling people, you know, I believe in liberty and freedom. The majority of them, when they hear that, they imagine what, what, what they're actually hearing is, I want people to be free to hurt each other. That's how, it, that's, how it, 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 that's how they're wired. That's how they've been educated or trained to believe. And people say, oh, well, you know, that's because of the state. The state did that. No, the state didn't do that. People motivated ideologues took control of institutions and used those institutions to do that because they understand that the institutions control the control thoughts. So if you want to change people's attitude, if you want to change their mentality, you have to control the institutions that, that frame their reality for them. And to do that, you have to have wealth, power, and influence. Those will, those are the things that you have to, you have to, it has to be a long game. Libertarians are the ones who claim to have low time preference. They claim to be the ones at the long time horizons. That's what the Austrian economics is all about low, low time preference. Yet they can't plan beyond the 2022 election cycle, the 2024. Like, what are you going to do in 2030? What are you going to do in 2040? The guy who's, who's championing the cause of taking over the LP, his message is going to spit some, some liberty fire shit or whatever he said. Like that, that's the extent of his planning. We're going to have some, we're going to say some stuff. Okay, what are you going to say? Oh, we're going to say that you don't need the state. We're going to, as he said, we're going to take control of the political system to tell people they don't need the political system. Oh, and, and have you considered how that's going to affect people? Like whether people are going to, going to respond to that, what, how that's going to, like, have you, have you thought about that? Because clearly you haven't. If that's what you, if that's what your plan is, you haven't actually considered what the, what the outcome is going to be. People, there aren't, 
the, the reason that there aren't many libertarians isn't because people haven't heard of libertarians. It's because people have heard of libertarians. <laughs> they, they know the libertarian message and they don't want anything to do with it. Matt, they just got to read human action and then they're good. Right. Just, I don't see what the problem right. is. Just read a yeah. thousand pages and you get in line. <laughs> read the thousand pages of, of like deep uh, philosophical you know, to most people, deep philosophical mumbo jumbo. Okay, whatever. What does that What does that mean for me? I got to feed my kids. What you know? What do you, What do you, What do you have for me? You You want me to go read this freaking book? No, I, screw you. Like, like, honestly, it's pretty disrespectful. Like, like, hey, you should take this thing you care about and get rid of it. It's shitty. You should care only about the thing that I care about. Well, why? Here, read this thousand page tome. Fuck you. I'm not going to do that. Like, this is the libertarian message to people. They don't have anything to offer. They're not bringing anything to the table. The entire premise of capitalism is that you start with value. You bring value to the table and you exchange it with someone else. But the only thing the libertarian political message is bringing to the table is anti-state. Nobody is more identified with the state than libertarians. Libertarians have their entire identity wrapped up in the state. If the state disappeared tomorrow, what would you do with yourself? If the vast majority of your current activity would disappear, then you'd be left with this, all this time and you're like, oh, what am I going to do now? That's the stuff you should be doing now. You need to be playing the long game the way the communists have been playing the long game. R like read Antonio Gramsci. He talks about his long, long march through the institutions. He, where he, he's a, 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 a devout Leninist. And his, he was an Italian guy. He was arrested in, the, I think, the 20s for opposing the fascists. And, and they, they locked him in prison. They said that the reason they were locking him up is because people needed to be protected from his mind. And so he sat there and started writing. He just wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote. And what he said is, he was, he was like, okay, well, I tried to lead the, the, the Leninist uprising, the communist uprising in, uh, in Italy, and I got arrested and failed. And Lenin tried to lead the communist uprising in, in the Soviet Union, and he was successful. So what, why, why did I fail? Why was he successful? And what he deduced was that the reason that communism was failing in, um, especially in all the Western nations, was because of the culture, because Christianity and Western, uh, uh, basically Western white culture, had achieved cultural hegemony, and it dominated the culture, it, it, it controlled all the institutions, and people were predisposed against communism because it was atheist, and it was, it was all, these, all these bad words. This, these Christian nations were completely opposed to it. So he said, in order for the communist revolution to be successful, we need to, we need to infiltrate and take over all of the institutions. And the most important institutions he named were the family, the church, the educational institutions, the media, the legal system. There were some others. I don't remember which ones they were. But the most important to him were the family and the church. Those were the biggest ones because he said that's where all of these, that's where the, the anti-communist ideas, that's where they're born. That's where it begins. If we can't take over those, those institutions, then the communist revolution will never be successful. So if the communists believe that the family and the church are the most important institutions to take down, to take control of in order to bring about the communist revolution, then if you're trying to fight the communist revolution, where should you be starting? Where should you be focused? This is probably the biggest change I've undertaken in my outlook from myself now, as opposed to myself maybe 10 or 15 years ago, who was, who was a libertarian then too, and had maybe the same uh, philosophical political beliefs. But I, I had more of that attitude of, you know, there was a time where I just thought, oh, I'll just be single my whole life and just, I'll just keep having fun and have fun and have fun and have fun. I have an amazing wife. I still have fun. I didn't know that could happen. But, um, but I, I really had the more of the libertine attitude. Uh, and anybody that would talk about, oh, the family or the church, I, I kind of had that attitude of, all right, old timers, whatever, man. You don't need all that stuff. And there is a strong element of libertinism in libertarianism. But now I've, I've just stepped so far back and seen the bigger picture. And now I'm, I'm like one of these, uh, these hokey you know, Christian conservatives that I used to deride when I was younger because I see the same thing. I see attacks on the family, on the church that I'm not even a member of, but on the institutions as 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 what they are, as as attacks against culture, as attacks as basically you know as 
as the first march for communism as as the first step because when you eliminate the church when you eliminate the family i think they're trying to eliminate more more than even take it over um there's that that much resistance is gone when young men or fighting age men or what have you do not have a family to protect do not have something deeper they believe in those are the men that are going to be very 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 easily manipulated into doing bad things bad things against the rest of us Yes, absolutely. And they and they, they understand that with you get rid of those institutions, the institutions that create the stability that are like the structure of society, if you tear them apart, you create chaos, which is it makes sense. If you destroy order, you get chaos. And it's out of chaos that that the state is born, that the state, the state depends upon the chaos to to operate and to function and to take on more power. But ultimately, it's not the state taking on more power. It's powerful, wealthy people. And those powerful, wealthy people are willing to use whatever ideology they need to get more power. It just so happens that communism works really, really well because the communists have planned for the total destruction and breakdown of existing civilization for the sake of rebuilding a new civilization on top of it. So yeah, you're correct. They're not taking, trying to take over the family or the church. They're trying to replace them. They're replacing them with institutions that they control. Because once you control what people believe, once you control people's values, you control the direction of the society. It doesn't matter whether you have communism or capitalism or, or, or whatever. If you control what people think, you can use, you, you can use any sort of, of economic system. The economic system is downstream of the rest of these things. So it's been, it's been very um, fashionable among libertarians to scoff at uh, like right-wing conservative Republicans or whatever who are concerned about the culture war. But the reason they're concerned about the culture war is because they recognize that when the culture falls, the politics will fall with it. And that's what's happening. The, the, all of these wars were all had in the culture before they reached the political conversation, before they reached the actual policy side of the government. The conversations were already settled within the culture, and then the government followed. So if you want to do something with the government, if you want the government to look different than it does now, you need to be engaged on the cultural front. And then you need to have an idea of where things need to go. Because this is, this is the outside of the cultural thing. If you're just starting to talk about, you know, what would the ideal state look like? This is where you get the, where you get the monarchy thing. And obviously, I'm, I've been influenced by, uh, by Mentress Moldbug, um, Curtis Yarvin on Unqualified Reservations. Um, another really, really good book to read is uh, The Machiavellians by James Burnham, if you really want to understand mm -hmm. the nature of this. And what, what he outlines, what Burnham outlines is that the, these different Machiavellian thinkers identified in politics that you have that every single political message has two parts. It has the formal meaning and it has the informal meaning. The formal meaning is the, the, the reason that they give. So, uh, you know, uh, let's take uh, minimum wage. So the formal justification for minimum wage is people who work minimum wage jobs are having a hard time getting by. So we need to raise the minimum wage so people are required to pay them more money so that they'll take home more money and they'll be able to buy more stuff. Like that's the formal justification for the minimum wage. But everybody knows that's not the real reason. Like within your audience, everyone knows that's not the justification. The justification for it is the institutions are advocating for this because number one, people within academia, a lot of them are just idiots. You know, you've got a bunch of these people who've never lived, lived a life outside of academia. And so they don't understand the economic realities of it. And they just think you just do something because it helps the poor people. Sure. Yeah. And I don't think most academics that support this stuff are in in their mind, in bed with the corporations, but they are useful idiots. Right, exactly, exactly. The corporations have an incentive to platform them and, 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 and elevate their voice and endorse them to throw their uh, credibility. Because if it's a corporation, it naturally people naturally find it credible. They naturally see it as a source of authority because that's the way human beings are wired. So they throw their authority, their credibility behind the, uh, the, the, this message because it kneecaps their competition. That's the purpose of it. So when libertarians come out and they're like, oh, you can't do this because it's going to knee out the competition. You're not talking to the, to the actual decision makers. The people who you're talking to are NPCs. They've, they've been programmed with a message to go out and spread it to give the impression of popular support so that this policy can be passed. The policy is going to be passed no matter what, because th this is the nature of the structure. They just have to go through the motions of, of creating these formal justifications for it so that they can pretend that they're noble and, and they, you know, the, the, the victors write the history books. So they give their formal justifications for why all the noble reasons they did all these things, when in reality, the informal and the actual reason they're doing it is to protect and insulate their wealth. And that's ultimately, the majority of these things are just uh, 
uh, if you trace it back, people say follow the money for a reason. It's, it's the ruling elite is doing things that are going to ins insulate and protect themselves and make themselves wealthier. And this, this process is going to continue on and on and on until eventually the masses get so upset that, that they just flip the chessboard over and say, screw all this, we're starting over again. So that's why you have to get the vaccine passports and you have to get people controlled and docile and, um, and, and, and held down where they can no longer overthrow the system because now you've reached, I mean, they're talking about like drinking kids' blood to live forever and they're doing yeah, neural stuff. Openly, and openly, and like, stuff. like Alex Jones theories are now like Time Magazine articles. Right, <laughs> it's right, It's yeah. crazy the world the, we're in now. The arc of history is long, but it always bends toward Alex Jones being right. <laughs> that's yep. that's the reality of the world. So th that's, where I, that's where I want people to be to be thinking, that's where I want people to start looking is, is dealing with politics as an, as, a, as an actual phenomenon. Get into the world of the is and not the world of the ought. Yeah, you would like to have a, a fantastic encapistan. How do we get there? That ultimately the libertarian message is the end goal. It's not the means of getting there. If you want a society that respects the nap and is built around property rights, has property rights enforced absolutely, well then you don't need a, you don't want a limited government you want a unlimited government because that government needs to have absolute power to enforce property rights. Whatever the government is, whatever this, the, the, I mean, saying like not a, not a, a capital S state, but just a, just whatever the government is. Small G need, government. Small G government. It needs to have absolute ability to enforce property rights. Now, maybe that's a technological government. Maybe it's a cultural government. Maybe it's a, that, that's where you get religion and politics. If you have a whole bunch of people who all share the same belief system, they all have the same values they all believe in the same thing. If you get a whole bunch of people who all believe in the nap together and they have an incentive to all respect the nap together, now you have the formula for a society where you can have a libertarian uh, 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 a process or libertarian government. And, and so, the, so, but ultimately that's not a moral question. It's an engineering question. And so I want people to think about how do we engineer that solution? How do we create the network of incentives necessary to, to bring about the sort of society that we would want to live in, taking into consideration the way that the, the cycle of human history and the nature of ritual and all this other stuff. And I, I think this conversation has been a pretty good preview of what people can expect to hear you and Steven talk about on King Pilled. Uh, I've really been enjoying them. I try to tune into the, the streams when I can. Sometimes I check them out after the fact. Um, and of course, people can find you on Wealth, Power, and Influence uh, with Jason Stapleton three days a week. So before I let you go, Matt, just give everybody the roundup. I know I just did that roundup, but uh, anything else you <laughs> want to mention about uh, you know, when, where they can, when and where they can find the show and anything else you want to plug? Uh, so we go live every uh, Monday and Thursday afternoon. Um, we're going to be going live here in about an hour after we're done with this show um, at 1 p.m. Right now we're only on YouTube, so just look up King Pilled, all one word, on, on YouTube. And uh, uh, we're pretty soon we're going to get ourselves out on, on iTunes and as an, as an audio podcast as well. But we're working on getting well, good because that's my only request. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We've had we've had a lot of people say that because <laughs> I like to listen as, on the go and it's just a little harder to do that on YouTube. So yeah, that's, yep. that's my so, one request. So glad to hear that's on the way. I, hopefully, I really hopefully do. within the next right. couple of weeks, we're working on the logo, working all the branding and everything for it, and then uh, we'll roll that out. And then you can follow me on Twitter. That's where I'm most active at Real King Pilled. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna get started on Gab here soon when I have the time. Um, you can find me on Gab at King Pilled. Uh, yeah, and then Wealth, Power, and Influence, and that's it. All right. Well, Matt, thanks so much, man. It's been a blast having you on, and uh, we will be tuning in for sure. At least I will be. I can't speak for everybody, but uh, <laughs> keep up the great it. work, Matt. Keep on roaring. Live on! And live free.